should to everyone. So uh, thanks for all the, the talks the uh, talks at this uh, stimulating conference and all the back and forth discussion, as well as to Natasha and all the people in the background who've been putting this event together. Uh, of course, the, the actual conference days have a lot of organizing uh, behind the scenes, even in this, in this plague time. Um, one of the interesting, fascinating things about the Persian Wars, of course, is that they bring together a careful and methodical scholarship, taking advantage of the, the riches of sources like Herodotus or these, uh, or the, uh, in the, or the Greek or Persian seals. But they also bring together a lot of imagination and uh, loose language and other things that are, uh, things that are, come from somewhere different. So in, when I was looking for a paper, I decided to go through one of these ideas that seems a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, extravagant, and see if there's maybe some some kernel of value of why people keep returning to it. And that is the sort of paradox that very many readers of Herodotus have noticed that his Greeks seem unsure about what to do about the Xerxes invasion. So it's not just they many of them flee or submit to the invaders, but then also the ones who do resist are hesitating. They try different things. They change their minds. They can, so they consider defending Tempe Pass in Thessaly, and then they retreat. They aren't sure whether to stay on Salamis or sail away. And of course, at Plataea, they march back and forth. And they struggle to counter the Persian attacks on their sources of food and water. Um, Herodotus is keen to include stories of Persian blunders and selfishness, too. His Xerxes ignores fearsome omens and the wise advice of Demeritus and has to retreat in disgrace. His Artemisia deliberately rams a friendly ship and is rewarded by the king. And after brushing over the Persian sack of city after city in Ionia, he devotes two whole sections to lovingly describing how uh, Artabazus failed to conquer Potidaea. Mm. That's Rodus uh, 8, 128, 129. So given this, it's sort of surprising that when people retell the story of the Persian Wars, they often evoke the idea of professionalism and then make analogies to the European armies of the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, as recently as 2004, Barry Strauss at Cornell called the Spartans at Thermopylae the most efficient killing machine in the world or in the world history who wielded Greek military science, quote, against Persian blundering. And it's equally surprising this idea of professionalism to be applied for both sides, depending on who was telling the story. So to Arthur Farrell in the 1980s, the king's men were much more like uh, what Alexander or, or Wellington had than the free Greek armies were. And during the Cold War, writers such as Peter Green often hinted that Xerxes' men were really the fearsome Red Army waiting to roll over their Western neighbors. So the people who use this kind of language agree that one side should be the organized professional army, but they can't agree on which side that is. So today I will talk about why scholars make these comparisons, how a Cainid army is related to a Cainid society, how else you might think about the differences between the ancient armies. Well, it seems to me there's two main reasons this kind of language comes up. One is to do with identity and the other is to do with the idea of who has authority to write military history. Um, so sometimes the invocations of professionalism reflect who the writer identifies with. Because the Persian Wars have been appropriated so many times, they can serve as powerful symbols and metaphors. So if a writer identifies with the, per with the Greeks, it's tempting to uh, assimilate the Greeks with their own army, with other armies that they admire. And uh, militaries, paramilitaries, and wannabes often fetishize the Spartans because of all the early Greek armies, they seem the most like a modern army. But on the other hand, if you identify against the Persians, or just want to present them as powerful and menacing uh, to bring up the tension of your narrative, it's tempting to assimilate them with uh, armies that you or your audience are frightened of or see as powerful. So books about the Persian Wars often use language and arguments which would not normally be accepted in a scholarly publication, even if the authors are scholarly. Um, so other times the invocation of professionalism reflects ideas about who has the authority to write military history. 
In the 19th and 20th century, the writing of ancient military history was strongly influenced by staff colleges and military academies. Roll has argued that there was a fierce controversy in Imperial Germany about whether academics had any authority to write about military matters, where they should leave that to the army. This was reinforced when so many future academics were conscripted into the two world wars, and when after the Second World War, English-speaking academia turned away from military matters. Um, and officers tended to see the kind of military they would train to command, a military led by a specially educated and meritocratic elite, that's the ideal. Now, the modern military analogies offers, also offer escapes from some of the other problems, the lack of sources for events such as the Battle of Plataea, and the inability to be sure which bits of the ancient sources to believe in. And if you want to know how much room the Persian camp uh, would have needed if it had 300,000 men in it, or how far part of the Greek army could have marched in the night, uh, why not ask a soldier or use data from recent armies? Everybody here has read the papers by Watley and Maurice, which were inspired by their experiences during, during and after the First World War. There's another interesting paper on logistics by Bayerischer General de Infanterie uh, von Fischer from 1932, where Maurice estimated the largest possible army which could cross the Hellespont on that bridge of boats. Uh, von Fischer was franker that considering the narrative as a whole and the route as a whole, he had trouble believing an army of more than 40,000 Persians. Now, before this audience, I hardly need to say that the early Greek armies were aggressively amateurish. This is one of the few things that, that the California school and the Prince Van Wees schools could agree on. So the Western way of war contains some extravagant language about uh, ordered squares and deliberate drills, but also has chapters berating earlier scholars for uh, trying to make the ancient Greeks into too much like uh, professional soldiers and uh, trade generals. And Thucydides and Xenophon Spartans do behave more like a modern European soldiers, but Herodotus and Plato's uh, Spartans don't fight exactly the same way. And of course, in past decades, scholars, especially in the UK, have questioned uh, how many of these famous Spartan institutions can be traced back before Demopylae. Um, and even Xenophon Spartans are still part of a Greek culture of aristocratic amateurism. They were just more willing to accept orders and to train than, for example, Athenians were. So while it's disconcerting that scholars occasionally present Herodotus the Spartans as Tommy Atkins in a tunic, I think the best way of understanding this is as more a statement of sympathy and identity than a, some kind of sc careful scholarly conclusion that, that deserves a careful scholarly response. But for the Persian side, Persian armies haven't been so well under, intensely studied, and the sources have not been as accessible until a few decades ago. So now they've set the stage, I'd like to turn to where Xerxes' armies came from and how they learned their skills. In the period up to 480, we know the most about Achaemenid armies in the heartland of the empire. Partly this is because of the famous monuments from Persepolis and Susa, but mainly this is because of the so-called end of archives in 484 BC. In 484 BC, many families and temples in Southern Babylonia put away their archives and didn't touch them again. Carolyn Weirzegers has argued this was probably because these families and temples were implicated in the revolts against Xerxes under Shamash Ariba and Belshimani. And so because of this, we have a great deal of everyday uh, documents and texts, even some letters from Nabonidus up to the early years of Xerxes. Uh, and, but we don't have corresponding records from the city governors, satraps, or kings, because they weren't implicated in their revolt, and they probably kept more of their records on skin, wax, and papyrus, which don't survive on the ground so well. So even in this period where we have these wonderful documentary sources, we have to keep in mind that we have what was written down on clay and what was deposited in these archives that were put away. Uh, if, if we had something similar to the Persepolis archives that dealt with military matters, we might have a different perspective. But from these documents from Babylonia, we can see that property owners such as individuals or temples 
were obliged to provide armed soldiers for the king. They were divided into bowmen, horsemen, and chariot teams. Often individuals were organized into groups to simplify the administration. Citizens were often part of decuries and fifties. After the end of archives, we hear a lot about groups called Hathru or Hadru in Babylonia. These were often named after professions. They lived close together, often in the countryside, and they were and um, they, many of them were ethnic minorities, such as Judeans or descendants of Judeans. And Matthew Stolper has written the, the book on these that many of you will be familiar with. Um, and the cuneiform text also mentioned that lists of men liable to serve inside a hat through were had yeah, the men actually serving on behalf of them were kept on writing boards, so wax tablets. So okay, and we're dealing with a, a part of the rec written record, um, uh, even though what we have is so extravagant. Um, now, individuals who did not want to serve had alternatives. In this and other periods of Mesopotamian history, men who did not want to be called up could either find a substitute to serve for them, or they could pay a commutation payment so the king could hire a substitute. The famous contract between Gadalyama and Rimunanurta of the Murashu family uh, specifies that Gadalyama will be recorded on this uh, list for Rimunanurta as so yes, his substitute by the scribe of his hat roof. And Xenophon confirms that this was also practiced on the western fringes of the empire, or at least hints of it, when he, he has Agisileus uh, pr promise that rich Ionians will not be conscripted if they can find a substitute and provide the substitute with a horse and military equipment uh, to serve instead. So Orthodox Mesopotamian thinking, just like Greek thinking, was that every free man was a soldier. But in practice, quite a few men had other priorities. I find one detail in Babylonia especially striking. In Babylonia, soldiers were responsible for bringing a substantial amount of silver to pay for provisions, so-called loin eating. They didn't have to just bring food themselves because a Persian campaign could last a lot longer than three days. So you couldn't just carry a sack of barley and uh, onions with you. Uh, Gadalyama asked for one pound of silver uh, when he was going to be a substitute, aside from his horse and armor. And substitutes had to be paid a salary and loin girdling by their sponsors. And the wages in this long 6th century BC were often, were often quite high, up to uh, 10 shekels a month, which is the highest monthly wage that we uh, see in Babylonian in this period. So that'll be, by weight, that'll be about 20 drachmas a month, but silver was worth a bit more in Babylonia than the Aegean. So it's hard to make an exact equivalent. And both the Romans and the Athenians remembered that it had been important when they started paying their soldiers, not just expecting them to uh, serve at their own expense. Uh, Margaret Miller has imagined how lining up to receive rations, uh, uh, each precisely reflecting one's relationship with the king or the satrap, uh, might have worked psychologically. But on the same note, there's a difference between receiving the king's salt and buying the king's salt with your own money, even if they, if in theory the land that you land the, that your money comes from was granted by the king or the king's father. Um, now, because so few royalists had traveled texts about the to survive, we know less about standing forces. Um, we know them best through the Greek and Roman authors such as Xenophon. Powerful people in Mesopotamia had long maintained large households, such as the uh, 3,600 people who Sargon of Ak had boasted of uh, feeding. And it seems plausible that ethnic Persians were especially likely to be conscripted. But on the other hand, Xenophon equates the Persians undergoing the special Persian education with the Spartan peers. So, and Greeks are often vague about the difference between Persians, the whole nation, and Persians, the, uh, the aristocracy, the ethnoclast dominant, as Pierre Briant called it. So as far as we can tell, an early Achaemenid army consists of landowners with enough property that they did not need to work land, or their employees and dependents. The temples had dependent workers who they sent to do their, their military obligations. Uh, 
and smaller standing forces, uh, bodyguards, salaried foreigners, and so on. There were signs of over time and after 484, the Persians tried to convert more kinds of service to uh, cash payment rather than giving people the choice of serving themselves or finding a substitute or paying cash. And the army that we see was very socially and ethnically diverse. So for example, later in the fifth century at Elephantine on the upper Nile, we see a, a garrison of Arameans and Judeans, a kind of military quality, but their commanders often have uh, Iranian or Babylonian names. Um, so one key difference I see between the Achaemenid army and the armies that's often compared to is that the Achaemenid army was not an institution as far as I can tell. It was more like a bucket of beads which, which uh, kings or satraps could uh, choose from when they needed to put an army together. And the, so the Imperial Roman army had standardized paths of motion and ways of exchanging soldiers between units. Uh, the Achaemenid army did not. The Roman army was governed by special laws, such as the famous Augustan marriage ban. I have trouble thinking of anything similar in the Achaemenid world. Uh, being a member of a Batavian cohort was distinct from being a Batavian from a particular village, but being a Jew or an Aramean of Syene was probably not so distinct from being a, 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 a resident of this village in this community. The closest thing to a standard organization I can think of is like in the Roman cohorts in Legion, or the hence the units were organized in tens, hundreds, and thousands. And because the Achaemenid army was not an institution, it doesn't often appear as a political actor separate from population, the classes it was uh, drawn from. Now, because of the lack of narratives and military manuals, it's hard to talk about uh, how Achaemenid soldiers learned their trade. We have the famous passages on Persian education and mandatory military service in Herodotus, the Chiropidea, and Strabo. So in Babylonia, humble temple dependents were issued with bows and arrows. So the tradition of training and archery must have been quite widespread socially. These were not wealthy or uh, these were not wealthy people. They were probably uh, only part, they, they were obliged to work for the temple. Um, they weren't kind of the, the relatively wealthy people who seemed to be archers in the Greek world. Um, and then the Greek and Roman world, archers and horsemen tend to be seen as especially difficult to train, whereas it was thought that you can make a useful spearman relatively quickly, you didn't need very much training for that. Um, and the hat crew in Babylonia and the banners in Egypt exist in peacetime, so it seems plausible that there was some kind of peacetime training. Certainly Egyptian and Neo-Assyrian art often shows organized groups of troops moving across the battlefield together. And that's much harder to find in art from the Aegean. And Herodotus 959 also describes Mardonius's men raising their standards to uh, signal the final advance of Plataea. And there's famously nothing, no evidence for any kind of battle standards or visible signals like that in the Greek world until the campaigns of Alexander. Um, of course, in the 100 years after the event of describing Xenophon in the Anabasis famously describes how uh, orderly and quiet the Artaxerxes men were at the Battle of Cunaxa. Uh, he doesn't say they fought very well, but he has to admit that they were very orderly and uh, quiet when they advanced. So I'd argue that senior commanders and administrators probably learned their trade through family traditions, apprenticeship, experience organizing other large projects, and independent study. Greek writers tell us stories about aristocratic Greeks such as at Persian courts, such as Alcibiades or Phalanus. Uh, presumably these were just, uh, just some of the experts that wealthy Persians might hire to, and to learn from or to educate their children or educate uh, their households in, in different matters, including warfare. So basic training in the use of weapons was probably embedded in everyday life and childhood education. Uh, but slightly the Persian group trained as units. Again, we do have the, the tradition about the Persian education, whoever that applied to. And I think, so I think one other key difference between, key difference here is 
is that is that we have armies that have skills but not credentials because the general staff which emerged between the Napoleonic Wars in 1914 claimed that through their special education and their professional skills only they had the skills to uh, wage war effectively and they used this to seize control over the operational level of war from the traditional crowd of aristocrats and favorites and hangers on who were traditionally uh, led European armies. And they also established themselves as a distinct center of power with their own interests. But I can't think of an Achaemenid army which is not commanded by an aristocrat of some kind. Memnon of Rhodes was, of course, had family connections to the Farnabazids, Hellespontine Phrygia. And the Greek generals who get so much attention in the classical literary source tend to be paired with or subordinate to a Persian aristocrat. So I think that the lack of formal education qualification independent from other institutions is another key difference between uh, ancient armies and their own armies. One of the things which makes a profession a profession is that it uh, regulates itself. And, and uh, so we let doctors and engineers do things that no other people can't do because they impose certain standards of professionalism, education, and so on on their members. Um, now, it's hardly a new observation that equating either side of Alpatea with a modern European army is hardly new. J.F. Lazenby, for example, made that point in his 1993 book. But thinking about these similarities and differences at least gets us to the point that this was an imperial war on the imperial periphery. Of course, the Persians were the imperial side here. Uh, they had many capabilities which the average Greek city did not. They had their army integrated in the system in the bureaucracies uh, for collecting and redistributing resources. They had access to skills such as siege engineering to take cities, which early Greek cities armies could not do. But that doesn't mean that they did it the same way as uh, European armies in the last 200 years. And if we think about both about this imperial context and about trying to understand how imperial armies outside of this 19th, 20th century European tradition uh, have the capacities they do, why other armies off in the ancient world often struggled to achieve these things, and uh, what the advantages and disadvantages of these different systems were. I think we might come closer to understanding the Persian side of the story uh, as something interesting in its own right and not just as a, as a stand-in for, uh, for other struggles. I think I've come at the end of my time. So thank you. And I hope that we have a discussion after this. Well, thank you, Sean. That was really a, a great overview of the, the mechanics of how we can uh, extract information about the economic and social elements that contribute to the making up of the, the Persian army and, and whether we can consider professional or not on the basis of our definition of professional. That was very, very helpful and, and uh, a, a great overview. Do we have any questions? Um, John, John has his hand up. Yes. Okay. Uh, Sean, thank you for that talk, uh, which I really enjoyed, and, and you know, it really builds on uh, the the topics that you uh, explore in your book. Um, I know uh, there were limits of time for the talk itself, but uh, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about uh, your thoughts on the comparison between the Neo-Assyrian military system uh, and the uh, Achaemenid one. Uh, I found this one of the strengths of uh, your book in, in uh, looking at the Assyrian army uh, as a, uh, a sort of model through which we can try to understand uh, Persian military dynamics. Yes. Um, yeah, I, 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 and, and thanks for the kind words, because I, I know that, that chapter had, had strengths and weaknesses, let's say, but I do think it's the context we should maybe uh, set things in more. Um, one interesting difference I see is that the Assyrians make a big deal about uh, incorporating people into the land of Asher. And if you're Assyrian, you have special military obligations, which the other nations under Assyrian, Assyrian hegemony don't have. Uh, so for the Assyrians, it's important to not just deport people, but to make them part of the land of Asher, because then they're, they have military obligations. And Again, some views of the Persian army focus on the, you know, the Western Iranians or the Echtpurser, but 
at least in the documents we have, and again, keeping in mind what the, the that we don't have the royal or chatrapal records, we might give a different view. We, we seem to see that they're eagerly drawing on all kinds of communities and ethnic groups in uh, their empire. Um, um, and I, again, I mean, I think the, again, I, siege warfare, for example, is I think another good example, because we can see that at least the early Achaemenids could, could very much keep up this old Near Eastern tradition of besieging cities with putting a mound against the wall and advancing battering rams and probably siege towers up against it that we see so beautifully in the Neo-Syrian uh, sculptures. And um, that was, uh, I mean, that was a very, an, is, an issue that the early Greek armies struggled with because they quite liked the idea of uh, conquering their neighbors and, uh, and forcing them into larger political units, but they had, but they had trouble uh, with, with what's, what seemed to us from, the, uh, from our armchairs as, as not particularly as sophisticated devices. It, that seemed so difficult to build a siege mound and uh, push a battering ram up it, but it seems like it was uh, more difficult in practice than it seems. And if we try to think about how maybe how this knowledge of siege warfare was, was transmitted in the ancient Near East, um, before we have all these Greek engineering manuals that name the Greek aristocratic engineers. Um, and that might help us think about the transmission of knowledge and the uh, skills. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, Scarlett, uh, did you have a... Um... Yes, thank you. Um, and thank you for your paper, Sean. Uh, your paper really made me go back to Herodotus and think about... Um, a motif that Chris Pelling has identified as operative at Plataea, and this is the motif of cosmos or order um, in, in line with professionalism. He talks about this in his, um, his new book, Herodotus and the Question Why. Yeah. So um, Ardonius is amazed at the lack of order among the Lacedaemonians. They keep changing their wings. Um, mm -hmm. And then he finally leads the Persians after all these days of delay against the Greeks. Um, and at this point, his foreign armaments, they break into a run. And he says that it, it, it's a run with no order. Um, mm. When the Persians have to retreat, it's a, a retreat which happens with no order. Um, mm. And Herodotus talks about, you know, the problem of uh, the, the Persians being anoploi, which of course I would be interested, Meg, to hear what you thought about that. So I'm wondering how your research can help us to think about what Herodotus is saying about the Battle of Plataea and how there's a lack of professionalism in the, in the, in the Persian armament that he identifies. Yeah, I think that that's a very good and interesting point because I think our, our focus on what we think of as order and discipline comes out of one military context, but trying to figure out what it, what it might have meant to a, to a man from Halicarnassus in the fifth century BC might uh, tell us some interesting things. Um, Hmm. And of course, there's also the Homeric, there's also the Homeric illusions where a few times the Iliad wants us to know that the Trojans advance like a, like a disorderly flock of birds, making all kinds of different noises, whereas the Achaeans were, uh, were orderly. Yeah, um, that's a really good point. And, and you're right, Cosmos is constantly being referred to um, in Homeric, um, well, in particular in the Iliad as, as a, an attribute of good leaders. That's what good leaders do, um, which yeah. sort of speaks very negatively to Mardonius. And then speaking to, uh, to uh, John Highland's point, uh, there's also all this Neo-Assyrian uh, uh, language and rhetoric and self-justification and that uh, about going to war and uh, preserving order and uh, punishing treaty breakers and so on, which sometimes gets left out of the Cayman studies, which can be done from a more uh, Zoroastrian or Iranian centered perspective. But so, um, um, and of course the, the Persians are, seem, seem, to, seem to draw on both Iranian and Elamite traditions. Um, 
and they're also taking over these established empires to their west. So, um, uh, so sometimes, so, so I think there's also some room to to place some of these things, think things like trying to restore order uh, and and punish oath breakers in maybe a broader Near Eastern context, um, and not just exclusively an Iranian or Zoroastrian uh, context. Yeah, thank you. What what strikes me as interesting about his depiction of Plataea is the way that there are almost two armies. There's the Persian army and they fight with braveness and courage and they're yeah. in no way inferior, but then there's the rest of the army, which is something totally different from the Persians, right? Yeah. But and that, yeah. And that's know. also something we, we see elsewhere in, uh, in, in, in Greek historiography too. Um, um, I'm trying to think. Um, like uh, the battle that wasn't uh, outside of, I think, Miletus in the Anabasis, where, where, where Xenophon wants us to know that met, some of the Greek contingents were uh, preparing for battle in a nice, quietly and orderly way, while others were dropping their spears and looking for uh, somewhere to hide until uh, <laughs> things were over. I, I think we're, we're, I realize we're almost uh, out of our, in, we're now into our special general discussion time, but let's not worry about that and ask Paul to uh, uh, ask a question or raise your point. So my question was, I think <laughs> that there is very little drill uh, that was being done amongst hoplites, formal yes. drill, considered like early modern drill. Yeah. And my question is, what do we see amongst the Persians when we're considering things like uh, you know, larger units. Is there any sort of uh, drill? Are there, uh, like with the Greeks, obviously there's a lot of dancing that I think is sort of the bottom up way you coordinate groups. Is there anything like this amongst the Persians? Are there formal parades? Or what, what are the things where men would move together? Uh, that's a good question because, of course, recently quite a few, several different people have pointed out that maybe things in the Greek world, such as choral dances, might have been the thing they did to get experience moving together in time as William McNeil did. That, that maybe uh, square bashing isn't the only way of giving this kind of physicality, at least to the level which is necessary for using spears and shields, not, uh, not uh, muskets and Martini Henrys. There's that interesting Hittite um, instruction text for the royal bodyguards, which, which describes uh, the royal bodyguards practicing moving together uh, when they're out, outside in front of the king's court when he's judging law cases, and then when the king's about to ride through the countryside and it's part of a procession with guards in front of him to keep uh, stray animals out of the way and so on. Um, and like I said, I think it, 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 it's striking to me that, for example, in New Kingdom Egyptian art, there's all these pictures of groups of four or so uh, Egyptian infantry moving together through the chaos of the battle side to side. And speaking of this, the, the chaos and the cosmos idea too, uh, again, for, the, for, this, for this New Kingdom art, for this uh, also Neo-Syrian art, uh, they like to show uh, chaos and bodies uh, screwed everywhere and uh, bodies running every way. Uh, and then the, their own troops uh, in some kind of organized collective action. Um, Assyrian art, I think the, the most realistic portrayal of what Assyrians look like in combat is actually on that lion hunt. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's maybe something. Yeah. And there's those pictures of uh, Assyrian troops going through forests or swamps uh, side by side in rows of spearmen mm -hmm. that kind of recall the, some of the Herodotus' rhetoric about uh, the Persian army uh, searching islands like uh, a net of fish. Um, so since we don't have military manuals for the first millennium from the Near East, it's difficult. I, I mean, the closest thing I suppose is the book of the Maccabees. Mm -hmm. I suspect that there was some, that there was uh, some kind of practice in collective moving and, and there's also, we hear about the Persian troops calling the armies together at specific points. Um, so Galiyama was, was had to go to Uruk as part of a larger army. There's actually a lot of tablets which talk about uh, this, this calling together troops in Babylonia at Uruk under uh, Darius II. 
But then there's also the bit in uh, Xenophon's in Xenophon's uh, economy, economy and the Carapidea about the per king's troops being inspected every year. Um, and it would make sense that there was some kind of uh, training at these occasions. Um, so I would, again, I suspect that there is some kind of collective training in the background that we just don't hear about because our sources aren't really interested in um, especially what, uh, what uh, ordinary barbarians are doing. You know, the, the, Greek, the Greek literary tradition will tell us about aristocrats like Mardonius or Phanabazus, but they aren't really interested in the, the ordinary soldiers. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. Um, Christopher, did you? Um, yeah, the, well, various things have gone through in my mind. Um, I mean, the, the essential problem about getting a grip on the Achaemenid army is, is, is a, it, it is a source one, it's a data problem. And it's one of those problems, um, like many in Achaemenid history, which are all to do with, with an encircling gloom into which occasionally bright beams of light shine, not necessarily where you'd want them. So, um, I mean, we can say a great deal uh, in a sense about uh, the military environment of Achaemenid Babylonia, as, mm -hmm. as Sean has, has, has shown, though at one level it's really a series of propositions about Babylonian taxation and economic activity rather than actually sources about um, the military environment itself. It's, it's, it's kind of, it's a meta source, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, you can perhaps discern large groups of of military people in the Persepolis fortification tablets, though, I mean, opinions might differ about the degree of their military character, but it's partly because what you don't actually see them being is military. You see them as groups of people moving around in certain, again, types of economic setting. Right. What you see is the economic um, spin from this. Um, Delephantony, you see the economic and social life of a bunch of people who are actually also soldiers, but you never see them as soldiers. Um, there are occasional similar traces in the Bactrian Aramaic documents. Um, what you don't see is, um, it, is, is kind of the core. Um, I mean, Isocrates somewhere talks about the army that goes around with the king. I think yes. that's as close as you ever get to somewhat a Greek source referring somehow to the core, as you might say, professional, but at any rate, the closest thing to a standing army. Yeah. And the only other thing you could put into that category is precisely those wretched immortals we were talking about yesterday, yeah. um, who, who are at least conceived as a coherent, um, a special body of people of a certain size. I mean, to the point that their size is kind of reinforced by this notion that it's always maintained at full, you know, yeah. at full capacity, um, which is, you know, is a kind of ideal, I suppose. Um, they're not a very large group, though 10,000 isn't to be sneezed at, but, it, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it, it, it's kind of ordinary. Um, I mean, my conception of the, of the army is that it's a bit like what I said about Plataea. You have, you have an Iranian core, um, and in practice at Plataea, half of it ran away, but, you know, um, because its commander sauced intelligently where the way things were going, but you have an Iranian core and then all other sorts of, of stuff, um, which may only come from peripheries. It may sometimes come from Babylonia. I mean, there are documents suggesting when Darius went on an expedition to Egypt early in his reign, um, people were recruited in Babylon to do that. Um, I do not believe that they would necessarily have been particularly militarily useful, except insofar as the people who actually went were effectively mercenaries who were hired by other people to serve for them. I mean, that's where the professionalism would come in. But, but I, I, I find I struggle to, under, to, to decide how much the, what is the equivalent of the Persian high command, um, reckoned on such people as a crucial part of what we might loosely call a Persian army. My suspicion is not very high, at least in, in the early period, but then things may be, well, things may very well be rather different 150 years later. 
um, I mean, th things don't remain unchanged. I mean, one thing doesn't remain unchanged that Sean was talking about is all this stuff, earlier Achaemenid armies have this big reputation for building siege mounds and being almost like Assyrians when it comes to battering their ways into cities. And after that early period, nothing. We, we never hear really about that as a feature of, a, of, of Persian armies again. Um, and, and that I find puzzling, but you know, things change, not always for the better. Yeah. Well, I guess one 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 thing I could say is one thing I I I I guess I came across in this talk is that having all these bureaucratic resources to collect and redistribute resources was was a useful thing. I mean that was a big that's a big thing in Thucydides, obviously, that the Athenians could do all kinds of stuff because they had these tax revenues and these systems for administration. Uh and that when the Spartan, if the Peloponnesians wanted to invade Attica for more than a few weeks, uh, let alone go further afield or raise a navy, uh, it was difficult because they didn't have the, uh, the, the fundraising resources. They had lots of soldiers, but um, that, that, was, that, was, that was only good. For, that, was only, that was good for some things. Um, and again, um, I mean, I one thing I wish I'd been able to do in my book, and which one of the reviewers rightly criticized me for, was not doing more connections to the, to the Hellenistic period, because in then we also see a similar system, especially especially well documented in Egypt, of uh, men being granted granted land which they can use mm. to uh, support themselves when they're when they're called up to be in the army. Um, of course, we also see this 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 diversity of, of uh, the soldiers in Egypt, both in terms of their ethnicity and in terms of their origin. And of course, what these ethnic labels mean in Ptolemaic uh, papyri mean is a whole other uh, can of worms. Um, so, I mean, I think, yes, I, I, I think, it is a challenge that we don't have that to understand how well an army works, you really need sources from within it at the kind of social level, which isn't the kind of thing that we have from the Achaemenid world. You know, we have the, the Greek sources talking about, and there were uh, 10 myriads of barbarians, or, uh, and Mardonius took 12 myriads to fight the Plataea. Um, but we don't have the, I mean, uh, one conscript army can be enthusiastic, can be enthusiastic and reasonably effective. Another conscript army can be uh, just just uh, biding time and looking for a place to have a nap and uh, get through their service as quickly as possible with all their limbs intact. So, um, figuring out how well this system worked in practice and, and challenging the 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 stories that the classical literary tradition love to tell us is a, is, is a challenge. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, Yanni, should we turn to you and your question? Thank you. First of all, hi, Son. Uh, pleasure to finally talk to you in person, sort of, so to speak, after years of corresponding Same. Yes. <laughs> in yes. other discussion forms. Yes. Um, so the, the Greek Unprofessionalism is uh, infamous, especially when it comes to co cooperating with uh, other armies and you know forming big armies. But in a sense, they are expert in what they're doing because they are um, they have the internal strife, they have this war culture, mm. um, their art is full of um, military themes. For centuries before the Persian Wars. Yes. <clears throat> what about the, the Persian army that came, that invaded Greece? I mean, how much action, especially in pitch battles, would the, the average Persian soldier have mm -hmm. seen? And how, what experience would the, the, the Persian commanders have? We know of the expeditions in Scythia and the insurrection in Egypt, but still not the kind of pitched battles that they were forced to 
to fight in Greece? Although, I mean, you could equally say that, you know, Plataea, something the size of Plataea was, was, was un unprecedented too. Uh, whether or not you believe Herodotus' 38,500 uh, free Greek hoplites um, uh, was certainly, it must have been the largest Greek army that, there, that there'd be in, in, in living memory. Um, and certainly that probably has something to do with the reasons that, uh, that the Greeks seem to be uh, struggling a bit to try to figure out uh, what, to, what to do with this situation and why they have troubles with supply or so on. Yeah, the, prob the problem is that because the Achaemenids weren't interested in have, writing, producing something like the uh, Neo-Assyrian annals that, that tell you who they're fighting every year and uh, why the blighters deserved it and uh, just how the king uh, punished them. Um, we, don't have, hear about, we don't hear about wars usually unless they're mentioned in the... Uh, that's a literary edition. And um, I think that must with Uruk when under Drive the Second. I'd like to write an article on that at some point, just because it's one of the rare cases where there's it might it might be mentioned in Catesius, or at least it might have been behind some of the stories in Catesius. There's I think there's I think six or ten tablets to mention truth being called up this year. Um, I think also we shouldn't exaggerate the the extent of internal peace in the Persian Empire. Um, of course, Benjamin Isaac uh, uh, 40 years ago pointed out that if you look at uh, sources in the Roman Empire, especially sources from subjects like, uh, like the Babylonian Talmud, uh, you see quite a lot of evidence that in the eastern province of the Roman Empire, there's a lot of uh, small scale violence and banditry and so on. Um, <laughs> it's a lot of these different communities. Um, that doesn't get noticed in our sources unless the emperor decides to do something about it, or at least the governor sends out a whole legion. Um, so presumably that's there to give, and of course there's also things like um, oh God, um, the, the conflicts in Anatolia, which, which Xenophon tells us so much about. Um, so So, I mean, I also, I think that lack of practice with serious opponents might have something to do with the military troubles of the Persians in later periods, mm. but this close to the period of initially putting the empire together when they're still trying to, when they're still uh, fighting out where its Western boundaries are going to be exactly I think that's a little bit harder. And sorry, I couldn't give you anything more uh, concrete. Thank you, thank you. Given the state of our evidence, you've given us a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Natasha. Um, so thank you so much, uh, everybody, for this three amazing talks. I think my question <clears throat> is very broad, just sort of reflecting the amount of things that I need to, to learn, but... Um, so, uh, uh, like, my question was um, about the, uh, we, we spoke a lot about compulsion uh, in relation to the Greek contingents uh, in the uh, Achaemenid army, right? We spoke yes. about Phokis and, and Macedon, etc. So, um, do we have any sort of better resolution evidence about ways of compulsion, especially beyond Herodotus. And yeah. I think what, what Christopher just sure. said, sort of like this kind of review that uh, you, you gave of like how a Kemenid army would work and especially with sort of like being the mercenaries, for me, that was already very, informative but yes. uh and it's also a question to uh, like everybody including margaret uh, including meg because um i'm thinking not only about the greeks but about this sort of infinite amazing list of um contingents uh from book seven so who yes. are 
all those people in the sense, are they all mercenaries? Are they attracted or are they compelled? Uh, what are they, do we know anything about all of that? And the, the other thing that strikes me, of course, with the, the Catalog of Nations in book seven is that there Herodotus wants to, wants to show off everybody's individually and all the characteristics of the individual nations. But uh, in, in Babylonia, we see everybody's getting a bow and a spear and a quiver of arrows um, and a tunic and a mountain garment, whatever that is exactly. Uh, so these guys are armed like the, armed like, armed like the Ara West Iranians in Herodotus. And I, I, like others, I, I think that this, this list of contingents probably has something to do with uh, things like the reliefs of the throne bearers or reliefs of nations in the Caymanid monuments, where the, whatever this list came from, it's trying to show off the individuality of the different nations that the king rules. And then maybe actual armies are a lot less uh, colorful. Although it would be nice to have something about, as Christopher said, uh, how, were, how were these troops on Elephantine uh, armed? Were they archers? Were they spearmen? Uh, we don't know. Uh, 